So I have an important update in the current lawsuits against the ATF and their pistol brace rule, including the nationwide vacature of that rule. So let's talk about what is now happening with pistol braces. Now, really quick, before we jump into this video, I wanna ask you all for a huge favor. Looking at some of my analytics, about 60% of all my viewers are actually not subscribed to the channel. So if you wanna support the channel for free, please consider subscribing. And then also I wanna thank one of the main sponsors of the channel, which is First Form. First Form has amazing supplements. So if you're trying to get healthier, I highly recommend First Form, but also they are pro-freedom, they're pro-2A, and they support us here on the channel. So again, if you want amazing supplements and you wanna support a pro-America company, check out First Form using the links down below. Now, as I mentioned in the intro in this video, I have an update for you in the ATF pistol brace cases. The ATF has been suffering a ton of losses. They suffered multiple losses in various cases, all the way from the Cargill bump stock decision by the Supreme Court, that 63 decision, the engaged in business preliminary injunction that was issued against them, and then also the recent vacature of the pistol brace rule by the lower court judge, Judge Reed O'Connor. The ATF is no doubt scrambling to figure out what they actually wanna do going forward. However, now some of the plaintiffs in the pistol brace cases are taking this opportunity with the help of that recent Supreme Court decision in Cargill to try to expand on the pistol brace win and get this case thrown out and ultimately just win right here and now. One of the plaintiffs has filed a 28-J supplemental letter to the Fifth Circuit three-judge panel that already was set to review the brace case and this whole issue and review the preliminary injunction that was issued by the lower courts. That review was currently set to take place during the week of August 5th. The letter notified that panel that the merits decision was issued by Judge O'Connor and it struck down the rule in its entirety on a motion for summary judgment. That letter states to the three-judge panel that their review is no longer needed on that whole preliminary injunction issue. They don't need to have that hearing anymore. And that issue is now moot and essentially should be removed. And instead, all that's left to be done is for the ATF to decide if they are going to appeal that lower court final merits decision up to the Fifth Circuit. But all these other reviews that are going on right now at the Fifth Circuit level, one of the plaintiffs is arguing is no longer valid, is moot, and does not need to happen. However, also interesting, you have the state of Texas, who I believe is another plaintiff in a different case, has filed an additional letter to the three-judge panel, and they're asking for additional argument times when that August 5th hearing happens. So you have two plaintiffs arguing different things. One is saying that the whole injunction hearing right now is moot, doesn't need to happen. And then you have the state of Texas saying, you know, that they want the hearing potentially to move forward and they want additional time. Now, you may recall that the ATF recently decided to roll the dice on their appeal of the pistol brace cases, specifically to the Fifth Circuit on the preliminary injunctions. Those appeals include the Mock v. Garland FBC case, the Berto v. Garland case, and then a bunch of other cases that dealt with preliminary injunctions, which are just temporary forms of relief, and all those cases were consolidated at the Fifth Circuit level. Although the ATF has already lost once in the Fifth Circuit, specifically in the Mock case, the ATF decided that the lesser of evils to them was to appeal those preliminary injunctions and hope that the Fifth Circuit ruled in their favor. The ATF argued that despite what the Fifth Circuit said originally in the mock case, all the lower courts were wrong to follow that ruling. They also doubled down saying that the relief granted by the lower courts in all these different cases, including the Brito nationwide injunction, that they were too broad and therefore they also must be struck down by the Fifth Circuit. Now, if you're not aware, recently you had the Brito versus ATF case. And in that case, you had the lower court judge, Judge Matthew Kazmarek, who issued a preliminary injunction which blocked the brace rule in its entirety on a preliminary injunction stage. And that was also a nationwide block of the brace rule. Now, Judge Kazmarek, in his decision, essentially springboarded off of a recent decision by Judge Reed O'Connor in that Mock v. Garland case. And then also he used what the Fifth Circuit also said in that Mock case. Now, like I mentioned, the ATF decided to appeal all those decisions up to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit consolidated all those cases and was going to have a large hearing on August 5th, on the week of August 5th, um, on all these cases which dealt with preliminary injunctions. But while all this was happening at the same time, there was an even more important process that was going on, which was that the lower court judge, Judge O'Connor, was moving the mock case at that lower court level towards a final merits decision. Both parties filed motions for summary judgments, which are just simply motions to try to dismiss and resolve the case before going to a full hearing. In his decision, Judge O'Connor stated that at the conclusion of the majority's careful analysis, they held that the final rule is properly characterized as a legislative rule. And it is relatively straightforward that the final rule was not a logical outgrowth of the proposed rule. 
Therefore, the final rule must be set aside as unlawful or otherwise remanded for appropriate remediation. Here, the court declines the defendant's invitation to relitigate this issue and once again adopts the majority's well-reasoned conclusion as its own. Consequently, the court finds that the final rule violated the APA's procedural requirements because it was not a logical outgrowth of the proposed rule. Now, one of the main issues that Judge O'Connor and a lot of these courts are finding, specifically with the pistol brace case, is the fact that when the ATF first issued their notice of proposed rulemaking and had their first proposed rule, there was something known as the Worksheet 4999. That worksheet was essentially kind of like a report card where there was a point system where you would look at these standards on this report card. You would look at your specific firearm and how it was configured. And if it had maybe a certain um, brace attached to it or it was a certain length or weight, you would add points. And if you got to a certain point threshold, well then all of a sudden the ATF said under this standard, that would then be an SBR subject to the NFA and ATF's regulations and restrictions. So they had a report card system initially in the proposed rule, which we all commented against and we reacted to. But with the final rule, what the ATF decided to do was completely scrap that worksheet. And then they went to a more arbitrary, just vague standard, which had some of the characteristics and some of the you know, factors that were included in the worksheet, but the worksheet was completely done away with. And then there was a bunch of catch-all language that said that essentially at the ATF's discretion, they could determine what types of brace pistols or other types of firearms configured in certain ways would then be SBRs, kind of not leaving any guidance at all. And then also deviating very drastically from the proposed rule to the final rule. And that's what the courts are finding issues with. And ultimately Judge O'Connor in his decision found that that was invalid, it violated the EPA, and that's why the rule was struck down in its entirety. That decision essentially overrides the preliminary injunctions that are currently in place. Uh, but also right now the ATF still has time to appeal. They have at least until 90 days, which I believe is September 11th, to file their appeal to the Fifth Circuit. But we haven't seen that happen yet. But also with the recent Supreme Court 63 decision in the Cargill case, um, you know, it's very hard for the ATF to try to argue that these types of rules and this process are valid. So I think they're taking some time to decide what they're going to do. But one of the plaintiffs in this lawsuit is not taking their time. They're not waiting for the ATF to make up their mind. Instead, they filed a supplemental letter to the three judge panel in the Fifth Circuit, notifying them of Judge O'Connor's decision and telling them essentially that the preliminary injunction hearings and reviews, which were set for August, are now moot because you have a final merits case. However, it doesn't seem that maybe all the plaintiffs are on board with saying that the preliminary injunction is now moot, uh, that that hearing is moot in August. You have the state of Texas, who is one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuits, who moved for a 10 minute additional time when it comes to the preliminary injunction hearing. Now, ultimately, it's going to be up to the Fifth Circuit three judge panel to decide if they're going to moot those hearings in August um, and essentially just wait for the ATF to make their move and decide if they're going to appeal that final merits decision in the Mock v. Garland case. Now, ultimately, I would say that the ATF, of course, is going to appeal that merits decision up to the Fifth Circuit. And that's one of the big ones that we're going to be watching because, again, final merits decision striking down the entire rule. Again, already a favorable Fifth Circuit who's ruled on this issue before, has ruled in our favor on various other cases like the Cargill case. And now you have the Supreme Court's support in that 63 decision in Cargill. You have their Chevron decision in the LBE case. And then also now you have the pending Vanderstock case, which is set to be heard and decided, I believe, next year or next term. So again, the ATF strategy going forward might be just to buy some time right now. They're slow walking this. Uh, but ultimately, I think we have a very positive movement going forward when it comes to pistol braces. And as of right now, if you're asking, you know, what's the status of braces? Not only do you have various preliminary injunctions that are still technically in place, which protect your possession and use of braces on certain configurations, but then also you have the mock final merits decision that we're talking about here in this case, which again, vacated the entire rule that hasn't been appealed. It hasn't been stayed. So that's the status right now where of course there is a nationwide block on the rule. So as we get more information, as things develop, I will let you guys know. Also, if you like this video and you would like to support the channel, one of the best ways to do that is to like comment and subscribe. All those things help to fuel the algorithm and it signals to YouTube that you guys see value in these videos and in this type of two way news. But as always, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and never forget this nation was built by arm scholars, and this nation will be maintained by arm scholars.